Hey. Hello. Good. How are you, Patrick? Hi, Olivia. How are you doing? Thank Very you well, so much indeed. for joining. Um, so pleasure. I will just kick off the session by saying hi everyone, thanks for joining this evening. Um, my name is Olivia Kwaja, I'm a trustee at the Public Health Collaboration and I'm really delighted this evening to be joined by Patrick Holford and I'll let him introduce himself a little bit more in a moment um, but he will be talking to us about Alzheimer's and some of the, the, the recent developments in that area. Uh, but just to say Set up the the session for tonight um, and to give everyone a little bit of context especially those who may not know much about the public health collaboration we are a, um, a uk-based charity that is dedicated to helping people understand the importance of their own metabolic health and to providing the right information and tools for people to be empowered to very much taking control of their metabolic health and hopefully ensuring that they have a, a chronic disease free life and we're very very uh, passionate about helping people get there having an optimal life and also the societal uh, impacts that, that can have um, so we are um, at the moment at a period in our year where we are preparing for our annual conference and that's coming up in exactly two weeks today which we're all very excited about and we are <laughs> Um, very much talking about all of those points at the conference and all the different metabolic illnesses and trying to make sure people understand that if we were to take a, a preventative approach, we'd be able to um, reverse, reduce many of these, um, these chronic illnesses, um, prevent them from happening at all, and very much reduce the burden on the NHS and fix the NHS, which is the theme of our conference this year. So I will talk a little bit more about that um, during, during this evening. Um, but yeah, just for now, if everybody um, has that context, so what I will say is that as we go through and, and chat to Patrick, if you do have a question, um, please put it into the little speech bubble with a question mark, because that's um, the best way to be able to to see it um, um, amongst all the chat. Uh, so yeah, that would be great. We'll try and pull out some questions from there as we go along. So, uh, without further ado, Patrick, would you mind just introducing yourself for anyone who's not familiar with you, your background, your specialism, and your, uh, um, your organisation as well? Well, my, my interest is in what is it to be human and what is the fullest potential that we can have as human beings. And for that reason, I studied psychology. And I got interested in two things. One was intelligence. Uh, I figured if we could have more of it, the world would be a better place. In fact, I remember on a vaccine post, somebody posted, uh, <laughs> shame there isn't a vaccine against stupidity. Uh, I, I, I posted back, <laughs> the queue would be too long. And uh, the other, schizophrenia, because one, one in a hundred people have this terrible disease. Uh, and, you know, many commit suicide, it's absolutely awful. So I, you know, we were the first experimental psychology unit. So we're very into RCTs, randomized controlled trials. So I got together with a school teacher and we took 90 kids in a secondary school and we gave a third what was a relatively high dose of vitamins and minerals. We didn't know about essential fats in those days. A third on placebo, a third on nothing. Hired a professor who thought we were crazy. There's no way that giving vitamins will raise IQ. Uh, and uh, actually it did. We got a 10 point increase in IQ on the vitamins, three points on placebo, seven point difference. A five point difference will get half of all kids out of special educational need category back into normal schooling. Uh, it was published in the Lancet, uh, MRC statistician hit every front page news. And that was actually the first study in the world that showed that what you put into your mouth has a profound effect on how you, you think and feel. And then I got involved uh, with schizophrenia. And actually a lot of this kind of leads to what I'm doing now around Alzheimer's because uh, in those days, I mean, everyone, knows or should know and they probably don't in medicine because my dear friend at oxford university who was the vice dean professor david smith he sat in on the lecture on diabetes and uh, the lecturer did seven minutes on nutrition and said to the medical students that's all you're getting on nutrition you know in your training but lagra is classic b3 deficiency and um, you couldn't tell the difference between a schizophrenic and somebody with pellagra. So a very bright uh, professor who became the head of psychiatric research in Canada uh, said, well, maybe schizophrenics need a lot more B3 niacin than others. So he gave high dose niacin in the first ever double blind placebo control trial. And, uh, and these schizophrenics stopped being schizophrenic. 
And I'm, this is like early 1980, and I jumped on a plane, went to meet him, said, how many people have you treated with this mega dose vitamin approach? And he said, around 3,000. I said, what's your success rate? He said, 80% cure. I said, I've never seen a cured schizophrenic. Please define your terms. And he said, free of symptoms, able to socialize with family and friends, and paying income tax. Now, I'd never seen that. So I became his student, and then the student of Dr. Linus Pauling, who had two Nobel Prizes, 48 PhDs. And they developed a very fundamental concept called orthomolecular medicine, which led into functional medicine, and I called it optimum nutrition, started the Institute for Optimum Nutrition in 1984 to create a new profession called nutritional therapists who could work with doctors. So that's kind of it. And then around the turn of the century, I started the charity Food for the Brain Foundation, and we are on a mission, uh, and that is to prevent Alzheimer's because Alzheimer's is a preventable disease. Less than 1%, about half a percent is, quote, caused by genes in the genes. The large amount of Alzheimer's, just like diabetes and heart disease and most cancers and everything else is actually driven by things that we do. And uh, in all these years, you know, I've written 46 books and all sorts of stuff. I've really come to the conclusion there are only two fundamental causes of disease. One is ignorance and the other is addiction. So most people don't know what they should be doing. Um, and some do, but are addicted to it, you know, like sugar. And, uh, you know, behind that lies so many problems. So I'm terribly excited uh, to come to the Public Health Conference to share some absolute fundamentals because we have now tested over 400,000 people on a free online cognitive function test that anyone can do at Food for the Brain. And we then uh, got together a team of the, literally the world's top experts uh, in each area of prevention, like Professor Robert Lustig is our sugar man, Professor David Smith is our B vitamin man, Professor Jeremy Spencer is our polyphenol man, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And um, we created a questionnaire. So you do this test, which is interactive. It's an actual validated free online functional cognitive test. And uh, although it is not diagnostic, it's it, it, it would be if a doctor, you know, took that information and ruled out other problems. And then you do a questionnaire called your Dementia Risk Index, which we've developed with all these experts. And basically, if you're doing everything wrong, you score 100%. And if you're doing everything right, you score 0%. And our mission in life is to reach a million people and uh, drive their Dementia Risk Index down and monitor their cognitive function going up. And I'm going to be talking about some phenomenally strong evidence at the Public Health Collaboration uh, of why we already know uh, that this is, for so many people, a preventable disease. And really interesting, because we normally, I mean, the sort of politically correct statement is to say it's preventable but not curable, because in Alzheimer's you actually lose brain cells. You lose brain matter in this medial temporal lobe. But uh, to give you an example, uh, a fellow called uh, Nodge, Norris, uh, diagnosed in December with vascular dementia and Alzheimer's dementia, mixed dementia, uh, kept losing his way to the loo in his own home, couldn't really conceive of the concept of time as in tomorrow, used to plant out his entire garden, absolutely no way, couldn't eat and talk. And, uh, you know, when the diagnosis was made, there was literally no hope given. So his wife found our website, they did the test, they worked out what to do, changed everything, which included cutting out sugar, uh, going ketogenic five days a month, having something called C8 oil, which is what you make ketones from, taking, he was already taking omega-3, but he added B vitamins, and I'm going to explain in the conference why you have to have both, um, and uh, went, to, you know, he did a few other things, went to sleep early and so on. So by March, he's planned out and his whole garden and planted it. Uh, he's a computer program. He couldn't even turn his computer on or off. So he's back on the computer. Uh, he can find his way around. He can talk. And his wife says, I've got my husband back. So I don't make any claims, but we are seeing people in the sort of the yeah. earlier stages of dementia uh, who are coming back to life. That's, that's you know, so in incredible. Exactly. And what an introduction. <laughs> I think that was the most thorough introduction I've ever had. Um, but that's all so exciting. I can't wait to hear more. Um, just to pick up on a couple of points there, you said that you, you know, you started this whole journey based on um, an understanding about being able to improve and reverse schizophrenia. And that's something which you were doing, mm -hmm. was that more than 30 years ago now, could we say? 
Oh, okay. 1978 well, is kind of when we started. It's like 40 years, 50 years ago. 40 years ago. And, you know, at the moment, it's such an interesting discussion about the improvements you can make to mental health with changing your diet, which almost mm. sounds as though it's something new and and that we're just discovering. And you've been talking about this for decades. So that kind of... <laughs> well, it's true. Most people know. I mean, they literally don't realize this, but our brain size, that, that of Homo sapiens, uh, has been shrinking. Uh, it reached its pinnacle, 1.49 yeah. kg, about 10,000 years ago. It's now average 1.35 yeah. kg. So, you know, we think we're smarter, but I want to tell you something around that that's totally, in a way, fascinating, because I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that humanity comes from a chain of apes who exploited wetlands and swamplands and the water's edge and estuaries and therefore started to stand up wading in water. I mean, there's, there's about 20 obvious things that, you know, explain this connection. But the, the absolute clincher is that we humans are born with a waxy waterproof layer called the vernix, which does not exist in any land-based mammal, but it is chemically, biologically identical to that found in sea mammals. We're talking about seals, sea lions, etc., etc. Anyway, the point is, uh, we discover in Wales, where I, where I live, in the Gower Peninsula, uh, that uh, a 35,000 year old Homo sapiens, the Paviland man, turned out to be, uh, they thought it was a woman and then it was a man, so it's an early kind of switching going on there. And due to the jewelry, uh, it was actually a man. Um, and the ornaments. And anyway, when they analyzed the bones of this person, uh, 20, almost a quarter of their diet was marine food. Now, if you imagine that they would have been hunting and gathering and expending, one has to assume, at least double, if not three times the energy that we do, because we've got home delivery and cars, we don't have to hunt and fish and so on. That would mean that today, to achieve the same intake of nutrients, and we're talking here about omega-3, phospholipids, B12, selenium, iodine, zinc, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, uh, to, to achieve the same intake of nutrients from food, half of our entire food would have to be marine food. So when people, you know, we actually do need to supplement certain nutrients. I mean, it's just a fact. And, and uh, you, you know, when people say, why do you need to supplement? I said, well, it's actually because we don't eat enough. And we don't eat enough because we don't exercise. Uh, but one has to assume that modern man's brain must be processing at least as much, if not more, yeah. than ancient man's brain. So our need is the same, but our supply is massively reduced. So the RDA, which is the Ridiculous Dietary Arbitrary, uh, is somewhat irrelevant because we can find, for example, vitamin B12 in the normal reference range, you know, if a doctor tests your blood levels, we can find within that range, we're getting brain shrinkage caused by a lack of B12. So the optimal intake of nutrient is very simply the level that prevents a disease or, you know, or, 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 or takes away the symptoms. And it's really got nothing to do with, with the RDAs. They are kind of such a low level. It's much better to look back at our evolutionary design and yeah. say, what have we been achieving in the way of nutrients for the last 99.9% mm. of our evolution? And, you know, so we, we don't even realize yet just how much of these nutrients. And I went to the last public health collaboration conference. I just loved it. It was such fun and great to speak, tons to learn. And there's a little bit that, not difficult for me, because on the one hand, I'm totally delighted that doctors are waking up to the benefit of low carb and getting sugar out and all that sort of stuff, which was kind of what I, <laughs> what I was saying in the 1980s. Um, we need to wake up to, to the point about micronutrients, vitamins, minerals, and so on, because there's this sort of blanket expression, you know, within medicine that you can get everything you need from a well-balanced diet. And actually, a few years ago, about 10 years ago, I went public and said, you cannot get all the nutrients you need. You have to supplement vitamin D in the winter. You have to. Um, because we're all designed to be naked, living outdoors yeah. and a lot further south than England. And I got reported <laughs> to the Advertising Standards Agency, and, and I've got a black mark against me because one of their rules is you cannot imply in any shape or form that you cannot get all the nutrients you need from a well-balanced diet, which is not true. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> well, not one of the many myths that we want to be overturning, for sure. Um, and also, you mentioned that... Um, I think you said that ignorance and addiction are the two reasons why why humans won't be healthy. Mm. Is that what you mentioned? The reason? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, you know, we're just not taught this stuff. We don't understand. 
don't know. Absolutely. And that's why conferences are really so important because you can you know, expand that ignorance. But then, you know, then the other issue is, you know, we get addicted. Well, we actually, addicted. we're covering food addiction at and, the conference as well. So come to the conference to cure your ignorance and your addiction, I think, would be a good method, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, and how to mention proof of brain because, you know, you, you really, I mean, Abram Hoffer, I mentioned, you know, the, the genius professor of uh, research, uh, psychiatric research in Canada, he in his sort of mid 90s, uh, two weeks before his death, he stops seeing patients. OK, and he treated over 6000 patients successfully with schizophrenia. Yeah. Talking about no more hallucinations. And uh, four days before his death, he said, I'm not feeling very good. Two days before his death, he checked into the local hospital. He didn't have any discernible disease as such. And in the last 48 hours, his organs started to pack up. He died with no pain, at peace, no medication, um, with two weeks of work. You know, that is actually what we should yeah. you know that's how we should be living and yet right now, the average woman in the eu will spend 13 years unable to climb 10 stairs that's the average yeah so we we kind of accept i mean we want to make britain uh dementia yeah. unfriendly right there's all talk about making you know yeah. nice care homes and all the rest of it you know we want not to get there and it's absolutely possible and the wonderful thing is that everything that's, you know, the fantastic, you know, doctors and public health collaboration, Dr. David Unwin and others are saying to prevent diabetes and obesity and heart disease, et cetera, you know, protect the brain. Whatever you do for your brain, you know, if you get optimum nutrition right for the brain, you've got it right for the body. So it's the same thing. I mean, you know, you take a drug and you get a side effect. In this case, you, you change your diet, you get a side effect, and that is you get less of all these other diseases. So, so you know, I, I don't mean this the wrong way, but, you know, the NHS is the fastest growing failing business in Britain. Um, it doesn't, it, it, you know, all those wonderful doctors who need more money and need more help and need more support and all the nurses and so on, you know, are fantastic. But it's not more of anything that's going to save the NHS. It's not more doctors, not more nurses, not more money. It's less patience. Yeah. It's the Absolutely. only thing that could work. Less and patience is with a P, and that means prevention. Until prevention and also nutrition is at the very top of the public health agenda, uh, we don't really have a chance of turning the tide. So this year is public health collaborations mission, put health back in the NHS. And our charity, foodforthebrain.org, is working hand in hand to we help certainly are. facilitate Thanks, Patrick. that. Patrick. And I think you're really, you know, your point about optimal nutrition for the brain is optimal nutrition for the body is really pertinent point as well for why we are so excited to be covering Alzheimer's for the first time at our conference this year. We haven't covered that topic before. So I wonder whether you can tell us a little bit about what you'll be talking about and the kind of questions you'll be broadly answering, um, just to give everyone a bit of a taste for what you'll be, what you'll be covering. Well, yeah, and I quite like to do it in the context of making a comment okay. about the news yesterday. It sort of puts things in the so yesterday we had yet another anti-amyloid antibody injection drug and uh, the newspapers were full of titles like yeah. you know the beginning of the end uh, and what actually happened it was the end for two probably three people according to the bbc who died during the trial so we're talking about one in 500 on the trial died they reported, and this is all we have is a press release, we have no study, they reported that 24% got brain bleeding and an additional, well, we don't know if there's a crossover, 24% got brain swelling. And these are exactly the problems that could cause death. And it means that any older person doing this is going to have continuous needs for scanning to actually find out what's going on. And then they reported, you know, so that's kind of, you know, the downside, which is pretty massive. I mean, if one person died from taking too much vitamin C, it probably would be banned. Uh, and then they do what's called a clinical dementia rating. Uh, this is very relevant to what I'm going to talk about, which actually where the, the, the professional asks the carer or the, or the um, patient's you know, partner questions about their memory and function. So, you know, it's a sort of subjective process. Now, uh, the last study, um, Lacanamab, 
Uh, there are a lot of thoughts uh, and accusations. Actually, the study became unblinded. So normally the patient doesn't know if they're on placebo or drug and the, and, and the doctor, the experimenter doesn't know. But it's very, very hard to be on a drug where, you know, 20, where a quarter are getting bleeding and a quarter are getting swelling to not think, oh, I think I'm definitely on the drug. And then the problem is when you think you're on the drug, you go, oh, well, maybe, you know, my memory, you know, the investment is high. So unblinding. It. So what actually happened is 18 point scale, the last drug, lecanemab, got a 0.45 point, so less than half a point drop on an 18 point scale. Because the numbers were large enough, just statistically significant, this one was a 0.49 point drop, so you know, really the same thing. That level of, of benefit or, or change has no clinical significance at all. It would not be noticed by a patient, yeah. a carer, a doctor, you know, it's rather, and that is the best in a massively funded study with 1,700 people, you know. So we're talking about, when you have big numbers, you can sort of squeeze a little bit of uh, statistics out of it. And actually what happened, what we're saying is that those on the placebo got worse uh, by 2.4 points, and those on the drug got a little bit less worse by 1.7 points. And this is apparently, you know, the end of the beginning. Now, one of the things I'm gonna be talking about, which is an incredibly important discovery, is, um, Originally at Oxford University, they gave high dose B vitamins, B12, B6 folate, to people with pre-dementia. So the same group, same kind of study. And uh, they, they, 30 percent, right, of the people in this study uh, who started with what we call high homocysteine, which means that they need B vitamins. That's about 60 percent of the population of high homocysteine, the older population. 30 percent ended with no clinical dementia rating. That's what we've been talking about at all. So in other words, they would, they are diagnostically no longer have dementia. So we're not talking about worse versus a bit less worse. Better. We're talking mm -hmm. about better, right? Better. But then what was discovered, and this is what I'm going to talk about, is that we've actually learned for a very, very clear reason, which I won't go into here, but I will show at the conference, is that B vitamins in the brain will not work without omega-3. And the omega-3 won't work without B vitamins. So to give an example of this, one study which gave omega-3 and didn't have a lot of effect, went back and looked at the blood tests at the beginning and found a massive effect in that third who had better B vitamin status and no effect in those who had none. So we've, we've learned something terribly important. And to contextualize this, because what we want with any of these drugs or treatments is a hard measure. And the hardest measure, because it's actually what diagnoses Alzheimer's, is, is both cognitive changes and shrinkage of the brain. And uh, these anti-amyloid drugs have produced two to four, apparently, two to four percent less shrinkage. The latest meta-analysis shows they actually accelerate shrinkage, but, you know, their own studies show two to four percent less shrinkage. In the group with... B vitamins and sufficient omega-3, there was 73% less shrinkage. So we're talking 4%, 73%, you know, 30% actually getting better uh, versus, uh, you know, in, in their own studies with tons of money and possibly a little mm. bit of, you know, cheating to sort of squeeze out. And this is called, you know, the beginning of the Which end. And, and, you know, David it Cameron. really pains <laughs> to see that. Yeah. Absolutely. So, you know, and, and I mean, on that front, you know, Cameron was part of the group who started Dementia Moonshot, 160 million a year pledged by government into dementia research. And we can't find any of it that's truly going into prevention research. Now, what I just told you about the yeah. B vitamin omega thing uh, means that the obvious thing to do now is a study of the two together. And uh, the top scientists in the UK, I mean, these are all professors, Professor Peter Garrod, he's top neurologist, Professor David Smith, former, you know, second in charge at Oxford Medical School. I mean, top scientists, award winning top scientists have not been able to get the money to do this study for five years. Right. And we're talking about a tiny, tiny, tiny sum in comparison to the official 45 billion, but probably closer to 100 billion that's been spent on researching Alzheimer's drugs. You know, it's 3 million is what's needed to do a really good long-term study on B vitamins omega-3 versus 50 billion already spent, but actually a lot more. 
and it's 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 obscene is what it is and i love the bmj because they've been uh, you know actually putting it out there fantastic editorial right. on these drugs so so we are at this point where where doctors kind of yeah. have to stand up and be counted uh, you know we there's a very unhealthy relationship that has developed in medicine in the nhs you know with doctors and big pharma um, and uh, you know that relationship has to be broken and we've got to move towards yeah. the true causes of disease um, because only prevent things and public health collaboration is leading the way so you know if you're in medicine if you're a practitioner you know whoever you are um, come to the wonderful conference in Sheffield public health collaboration <laughs> You know the details. We totally agree, the and we will support that message. Um, that's just so interesting what you just went through through there, Patrick. And one question I have is: you said that you know you can't um, you can't cure dementia, you can't reverse the damage that has been done, but yet you saw in some of those um, trials that people are getting better. So how does that work? Well, yeah, I, I mean, in a sense, yeah. if you've lost brain mass, you know, which is actually what Alzheimer's is, and we see that in scans. Um, you're not going to get that brain mass back. But I think what's happening, and this is, is that, you know, cells are not yeah. only alive or dead. Um, you Bad know, visible. they're sort of dysfunctional. Yeah, yeah dysfunctional. And usually what yeah. there is to do with insulin resistance. Uh, so sugar, and actually also fructose and high fructose corn syrup, messes up the sugar metabolism in brain cells. Now, the amazing thing about brain cells is that they actually can either run on glucose, sugar, or on ketones. And ketones are not sugar, they're not fat, they're not protein, they're ketones. Yep. They're made in the liver from fat. So when you starve yourself or fast, your body will, will process your fat to make ketones. And if you give a, a neuron, a brain cell, uh, ketone or glucose yep. actually prefers ketones. So I think we're seeing uh, and we don't know you know this may not be in the category of cure because it may only be temporary um, is that brain cells are sort of half functioning or dysfunctioning because the sugar metabolism doesn't work if you actually feed them ketones or actually the yeah. medium chain triglyceride fats this is the eight oil is the direct source uh, you know or you go ketogenic um, those brain cells yeah. that have still got life in them come back to life and I think that's one of the reasons we're seeing an improvement. But I think that what's terribly important is the official figure given is that 40% of um, you know, the risk of Alzheimer's yeah. is preventable, caused by things that we can change. Um, but I think what we don't uh, really understand yet is the combination effect. So for example, the effect of B vitamins has been vastly underestimated and the effect of omega-3 have been vastly underestimated because we didn't realize one wouldn't work without the other. So I think what we're going to learn is that we're, we're going to learn the magic formula. You know, if you go low, low sugar, you know, if you go low carb and you exercise and you stimulate your mind and you make sure that your omega-3 intake is good. And very importantly, by the way, the B vitamin thing is largely to do with malabsorption. So if you take five um, over 60 year olds uh, and uh, you measure their B12, um, two of them will have insufficient or possibly yeah. three insufficient b12 now not necessarily b12 is in meat fish eggs and milk because they're not eating the foods they are but they're not absorbing the b12 and that is why you you actually have to the rda or ridiculous dietary arbitrary is 1.5 uh, microgram we give 500 microgram you know this is also why b12 sometimes is injected not because you need 500 but if we know now that if you flood the system orally you get a little bit more through so this is a situation where you you cannot do it with food i'm totally into real food whole food you yeah. know that that's a starting point but there are certain situations like in the winter vitamin d like b12 when you're getting older where you you just have got to do something different and i'm going to be talking all about nice. that at, oh we can't at the wait to hear, to hear all of that and the other part that you're involved in is that you're going to be on our panel uh which is a question we mm -hmm. are uh, going to put into a format of almost a discussion a debate about whether or not plants are needed in the diet so i guess you will have a, a particular stance on that is that um a discussion you're looking forward to and what do you think you might envisage it kind of turning out like 
No, no, I, I am very uh, looking forward to it. And I, you know, I tend <laughs> to support the underdog. Who's the underdog in this one? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure. We'll see how the... Because, you know, on the one side, you've got the vegans, you know, over here. And the other on the other side, people say, which, which is also partly true, that you don't need carbs in the sense, as I just yeah. explained, the body can run on ketones, not glucose. Uh, but it, it's a very sort of yeah. macronutrient view. Uh, they're not, not necessarily thinking about all the, you know, the nutrients that you get in fruit and vegetables and so on. So we've got the sort of the meaty people over here who are kind <laughs> of demonizing all carbs. And we've got the people over here who are demonizing all meat. So I think it's going to be an interesting debate. Uh, I can't say exactly what yeah. I'm going to say because yeah. it depends. Which I mean, way certainly the meat goes, side will have you know? your omega and your omega three and your B vitamins covered, right? Uh, uh, well, that that you know, not. I mean, remember, it's yeah. only B12 yeah. that is in animal products. So most of the other B vitamins are actually you know much okay. higher in you know in in the vegetable. So it depends, and things like nuts and seeds. I mean, depends, you yeah. know. You know, which is slightly different, of course. Um, they're phenomenally rich in, in a mm. lot of nutrients, so they're really important. And also beans, so there, you know, there there are certain foods. And I think that, you know, when I was saying what we know is like five hundred thousand years ago, I mean, so coinciding with eating uh, with fire, uh, we actually had an increase in carbohydrate um, because we could now process or cook foods that were previously indigestible. And you can see this in the DNA because suddenly there's a whole lot more enzymes, mm -hmm. amylases to digest carbohydrate and increased. Uh, so, you know, so it's not, you know, we have these very linear views where, you know, anti-carb or this or that, whatever. And uh, you know, it's, not all, it's, it's, it's not always correct. Uh, so yeah, it's gonna be a, you know, an interesting one there. So there are nutrients that you can get in, you know, fruits and vegetables that you, you can't, you know, really get in meat. And some may not agree. And of course, you know, one of the big problems that we've got is, um, is you know, what actually happens to animals. In the same way that I, I said to you, we were fit, right? Well, if your animal is too fit, uh, it's, you know, if you're growing, if you're selling meat and your animal is too fit, they're going to consume a lot more food. So you don't want your free range chickens <laughs> running around too much because yeah. they're going to cost you. They're not that free range. <laughs> but this is just a fact. Yeah, you know, they're not that free range. And also, you know, I happen to run safaris and, uh, you know, out there in the wild, animals are incredibly lean. So, you know, we sort of talk about eating fat, you know, and fattier meats, you know, to get the ketones, all that sort of stuff. But out there in nature, yeah. animals are lean. You know, have very fat on them. So the interesting thing, and I, I kind of like it, because having, you know, been in this field for 45 years, you, you get a whole lot of different, you know, perspective. I mean, you know, evolution and history and so on. And I, in a classic example of this is that, you know, I went through COVID like I, I do, you know, always. If I ever get the first sign of a cold, I take one gram, which is 20 oranges worth of vitamin C an hour. You know, I get, I want to get my blood level really, really high. And people think it's weird, but it's actually what every single animal on the planet does when exposed to a virus, because all animals make vitamin C, except for primates and fruit eating bats and guinea pigs and so on. There's just a few that don't. Guinea pig doesn't make vitamin C, which is why it's the experimental animal of choice. And um, we have the ability to make yeah. vitamin C in our evolution for, you know, very as a consequence, we've got this problem, you know, with viruses. So I do what every other animal does, you know, naturally. And it, it sounds weird, but it actually works. So, you know, when I got COVID, it's an 18 hour experience and, you know, back to work the next day sort of thing. So sometimes, you know, when you, when you understand evolution, you get a different perspective. And I think this debate of, you know, plant versus meat has to look you know, we can look at it from different angles. And I, so I hope to contribute angles that may not be, you know, dealt that sounds, with. You know, sounds making others. me more excited as you talk about it, because it just sounds so interesting as to all the points we're going to cover and the different viewpoints. So, um, and I'll probably just say at that, at this point, to anyone who's watching or watching the playback, uh, we are for the very first time this year, 
uh, introducing and offering a live stream option to join our conference. So we appreciate not everyone can get to Sheffield. I mean, if you can get to Sheffield, then please do come and join us. There's nothing that replaces being at the conference and seeing everybody and talking to people and being inspired. But if you can't, then please do consider live streaming in because there's going to be some really fantastic debates like the ones we just uh, talked about there. Um, so, uh, Patrick, I had another question for you, which is looking at the rest of the lineup that you're less involved in. Are there any topics or speakers that you're particularly excited about hearing? <laughs> oh, I want to hear them all. I mean, you've got, you know, absolutely fantastic speakers. And I don't necessarily know, you know, I mean, the ones I know are the ones I probably, you know, uh, it, it may learn less from. So it's the ones I don't know and the ones I don't recognize that, that are so interesting. And also, it's not just about knowing um, what to do, but how to do it. So I'm very interested to hear how it is, you know, for GPs on the coalface. And something we're going to be doing uh, as a, a world first is that I said we've tested 400,000 people. Our goal is to get to a million. We're actually going to be launching at the Public Health Collaboration and inviting doctors to join a, uh, a research study where all their patients can participate as citizen scientists for free online um, filling in the food for the brain or cognitive function test and uh, every GP can track their uh, patient base uh, so we learn actually how to change behavior and uh, as I said we hope to get to a, a million people you see doctors is just you know it's one thing to say prevention but yeah. how do you actually do it so I want to hear how you all face and I also want to offer a way that every single doctor can get every single patient doing something without involving their time yeah. or money or resource. Uh, so to take a bit of the load off uh, and yet make a phenomenal Absolutely. difference. Absolutely. So any doctors coming along, uh, please get in touch with Patrick who, and he will share that tool with you. And I've actually done, there it is. Yeah. Can you see this? Uh, what this is, by the way, I'll show you is on the, is, uh, on one side, the placebo, that's all the brain shrinkage yeah. in one year on the placebo. And on this side is the vitamins. So that's nine times less shrinkage of the brain in one year. Nine times less. Yeah. You know, brain scans don't lie. Amazing. I mean, that tool that you have on your website as well, and I'll be adding it to the show notes, but I have partaked in it. And it's, it's a really easy to fill in and quite insightful little program that you have there on figuring out your kind of rating for your for your brain health um i thought i was going to score quite well but actually you got me on sleep because sleep is my sleep is my one point that i'm not very good at so i have to uh, make some improvements there but it was very insightful to be able to get that little diagnostic and i'm sure many people would benefit from from using that so i'm really glad that you're going to have the chance to we'll get to help you get to that one million um people onto that tool as soon as we can so, um, yeah, so no other topics that you're particularly inclined towards? Are you going to be very Switzerland neutral? Okay. Yeah, I'm, I love them all. And, uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I mean, you know, it's really interesting to learn how we can encourage people, you know, down the low carb route. Because, you know, I, things have got worse. I mean, sugar's in everything. You know, it's just in absolutely everything. So, so you really have to kind of buck the trend yeah. to go in a different direction. And uh, you all want to have a good life. So it's important to find a way of, you know, of doing health and doing good nutrition uh, that not only makes you feel good, but, you know, that you can enjoy. So, you know, I love cooking food. My, my project at the moment is just farm to be doing beyond organic regenerative no-till farming yeah. so we're kind of looking at it from the soil into the food you know in terms of actual nutrients the sort of first bit of optimum nutrition now we know what the brain needs so i'm giving a talk to a few hundred farmers very soon called the soil food gut brain <laughs> super highway all connected so, it is so, i yeah, mean we're going to have a great I, discussion on that know, as well with jane buxton and he's going to be talking about whether or not or not cows are affecting the environment um in a bad way 
Um, we've got a, a debate about can you outrun a bad diet? So bringing the exercise point that you mentioned into the mix as well and understanding the effect it has. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about cancer for the very first time with Sophia Clemens uh, and others. We have Ben Bickman on insulin yeah. resistance. We have type 2 diabetes, as you'd expect, with Dr. Unwin, but also with Rory Taylor coming along. Um, what else do we have? Yeah, we, we yeah. some fabulous work. And, you know, the exercise I'm really interested because, you know, it's obviously so important, exercise and nutrition. But I, I, I always emphasize nutrition first. And the reason for that is that if you ask people, why don't you yeah. exercise? Most people will say, I feel tired. And uh, a child in an exam howler wrote, you know, modern man is a knackered <laughs> ape. Should be naked ape, but knackered ape. So people are tired. And when you get nutrition right, and sometimes, you know, you might be lacking a B vision. I actually think it was those homocysteine lowering B vitamins that made the difference to the IQ in children. So when you get your nutrition right, which yep. is not just the macro nutrients, less sugar, also your energy goes through the roof. And then when your energy goes through the roof, you actually feel like running or exercising. So I start with the nutrition, not because exercise isn't just as important, but you know, when you've got energy pumping through your system, I'm 65. So um, <laughs> I, I just got so much energy, you know, my eyes are worse, my hair is gone gray, but everything else works. Uh, so the problem when you get your nutrition right is what do you do with all, you know, the extra energy? Uh, so then exercise. And you also get energy you really from exercising, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it goes both ways. And then the important thing for you is, you know, every act animal when they exercise so you take a dog and it runs mm -hmm. around does a walk what do they do afterwards they go to sleep so sleep is your recovery time you know both for mental activity and physical activity so if you don't get the recovery time yep. you know that's not good so it's it's terribly to both exercise you know and sleep and learn new things so i took up a couple of years ago paragliding uh you know it's it's sort of multifaceted you've really got to concentrate and your body's moving around you've got the sense of balance and I actually noticed my brilliant paraglider teacher, um, Ali wow. from Cricowell in Wales. Is she with us tonight? School in paragliding. And he's taking, yeah, he's taking me off to the Alps. You know, I've now got my license. And I'm off to the Alps in October to, fl to fly across the Alps on a paraglider, you know? So learning new things is really, really good for the brain. And if you can learn new things that involve balance and exercise, in this case, one inevitably has to climb up the mountain first before you jump off it. Uh, you know, you're, you're getting all that stimulation. So it's very bad to retire early. Uh, we know that dementia risk increases in people who retire early. So you need to keep your mind active, your body active, your diet good, and then you end up with tons of energy. And then yeah. you can kind of, you know, and then you can start paragliding <laughs> to improve your life. That sounds so exactly. inspirational. <laughs> okay. Well, Patrick, it's been really fantastic to talk to you tonight. Um, uh, is there anything you'd like to add in terms of, uh, I know you've got your Food for the Brain um, website or any other resources that you'd like to point people towards? Well, no, I mean, foodforthebrain.org, you know, really is the place to go. And uh, if you look in the For You section, do look at our manifesto for change because it really explains the whole thing. And, uh, you know, that's really important. But I, I would say to any practitioners and doctors out there, probably feeling really tired and got too much to do, and I can't make it to go to a conference and so on. But it's so important because I honestly think that, you know, if you are a doctor and this is sort of on the edge of what you're very interested in, and you, if you actually take the trouble to go to this conference, I think a paradigm shift is going to occur for you. Uh, where you're going to find out what you can actually practically do with your patients that starts to make it fun to be a doctor. That's really important. So many doctors are depressed, uh, you know, because the system is depressing, people don't change and so on. But if you can actually make people better, uh, you know, it's such a, a fantastic thing. Um, so it's, it's switching, you know, it's a whole new paradigm. And I think that's possible. So I would say if you are a practitioner, and, uh, you know, really just make the effort. Go to Sheffield if you can. You can, you know, go online. But if you can, go. Because there's some really inspiring people. And we're going to learn a lot. And, you know, that is, you know, the future of medicine. We do not have to have all these terrible health problems, mental, physical, etc. It's just not necessary. So, you know, become part of the solution. 
Otherwise, you're part thank of you. the Thank you. On that note, I think that's the perfect ending. I would like to say thank you for joining us tonight. And I will be actually sharing a lot of content that uh, you have on your on your website on Food for the Brain. So if anyone's watching and is not sure where to go, we'll be we'll be sharing that on, on the PHC platforms um, in the next day or so to, to kind of add on to all of the great information that, that Patrick shared with us tonight. Uh, so without further ado, I'll say thanks everyone for joining. Please do come for our conference and please follow us. Please um, uh, come to our website as well and look at all the different ways that you can support us. And if you can't make it along to Sheffield, then don't forget you can live stream in. All the details are on phcuk.org forward slash conference. So thank you, Patrick, for your time. And I look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks time. Yeah, have a lovely evening. You too. Thank you, Olivia. Bye, everybody. Thanks for joining. You too.